world was ready to believe anything by 1915 of a nation for whom frightfulness was an accepted principle of warfare. And to isolated America, the bombing of London came as a grave shock. It was the first time an enemy had struck at English soil for nearly 900 years. Then, early in 1915, appeared the German U-boat. Sinking without trace, ship after ship, armed or unarmed, it was the German submarine which gave Americans their first real warning of how vital was their concern with Europe's war. For America was a neutral nation, and the rights of neutral nations on the high seas were being openly and flagrantly violated by Germany. What a way for a civilized nation to fight a war. Why shouldn't they sink English ships? Well, why don't the submarines give warning so the crews will have a chance to get into lifeboats? The Germans have got to sink ships if they're carrying munitions for the Allies. And suppose they have Americans on them? They shouldn't be there. The German government has warned them what would happen. They shouldn't be there. Huh. Don't make me laugh. But far more fateful in its influence on American opinion than the loss of cargoes or questions of international law was the submarine steadily mounting toll of human lives. Men like Theodore Roosevelt were now demanding forceful action to uphold the nation's traditional freedom of the seas. But few Americans would believe that their rights were seriously threatened. Flash! Sam, they've sunk the Lusitania. What? No circulation, we have an extra coming on. How many Americans aboard? 228. 96 point banner. Play up the American angle. The Germans had run a warning to Lusitania passes. What do you mean? In an ad in the New York Times. In the Times? Have you got a copy? I didn't think they'd dare to sink her. The warning of the German embassy had attracted little notice. It was unthinkable that Germany would sink the Lusitania. Her sailing had been set for a Saturday forenoon. On her passenger list were some of the proudest names of two continents. For the Lusitania was queen of the great Cunard fleet. It was to be a gay and festive voyage. <music> Nearly 2,000 souls were aboard. 1,200 never reached shore. No single disaster in half a century had stirred American emotions more profoundly. If Wilson stands for this, he'll stand for anything. Stand for what? Stand for murder. Murder of 114 Americans. Well, they shouldn't have been there. An American citizen has the right to travel anywhere he wants to. We ought to lick the Kaiser now and have it over with. You're going to have a hard time getting the folks in Montana to go chasing after the Kaiser. I suppose in Montana, they don't care how many Americans get killed. And what'll they say about the Lusitania? Well, in Montana, they think if a man goes out in the street when the shooting's going on, it's his own fault if he gets hit.
and indignation, deep and mounting, swept every community in the land. Throughout the nation on the following Sabbath, there were memorial services for the men, the women, and the children who were the Lusitania's martyred dead. Well, boys, what's on your minds? We came to find out what you're going to do about the Lusitania. To tell the truth, I hadn't thought of doing anything. John, you're our congressman. You know how we're feeling. Don't you think you ought to go to Washington and talk with President Wilson about this thing? Well, now, boys, you don't walk in on the president just that way. He's already said he'll hold Germany to strict accountability. John, we've been hearing about strict accountability for a long time. It seems to mean that when a German U-boat kills some more Americans, the president just sends another note. What do you want to do? You ought to go to Wilson and tell him he's got to act, and act quick. All right. I can go to Wilson. Are you boys willing to go to war? That's not the point, John, and you know it isn't. The point is, you want to do something, but you don't want to do the only thing the Germans would understand, war. This country isn't ready to fight a war, even if it wanted to. Just suppose I do go to the president. Suppose he says, all right, if you want a war, you'll get it. Do you want your boy to go to war, Ed? Do you, Frank? I know how you feel. I feel the same way. But it's war or nothing. And I still think it ought to be nothing. U.S. opinion was still deeply divided. To demands for action, Woodrow Wilson answered, there is such a thing as a nation being too proud to fight. It was a bitterly disputed phrase. But other U.S. citizens were going to war. Across the border, thousands of young Americans of military age were joining famed Canadian regiments, the Black Watch and the Princess Pats, to fight alongside Canadians in a cause they believed to be just. Bought and sent overseas by the contributions of U.S. communities, Driven by Americans who paid their own expenses, nearly 100 ambulances by the end of 1915 were on the battlefields of France. Bearing the name of a French soldier who had helped America to win her independence, the Lafayette Escadrille was an elite corps of U.S. volunteers. In the American community, emotion for the Allied cause was running high. And in a town as important as this, with the main line railroad, the reservoir, the college and all, they'd be sure to have at least one spy. Honestly, Dora, do you really believe Elizabeth Bensinger's husband is a spy? Where there's smoke, there's fire. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, Hello. Hello Mrs. Avril. Hello, Hello, Elizabeth. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Elizabeth. Yes? May I speak to you and Hilda a moment, please? Why, certainly. Hilda? I felt I ought to tell you that since we are working on bandages for the Allies, we all feel that perhaps you and Hilda could uh, make yourselves more useful somewhere else. I'm not quite sure that I understand what you mean, Dora. With feeling as it is about the Germans, I'm very sorry. But I'm sure you will avoid unpleasantness. 
if you go. Come, Hilda. community by 1915, the lines were slowly being drawn between peace at any price and intervention in the war. When I hear these fools shouting about being too proud to fight, it makes my blood boil. Don't they know that the Allies are fighting to save our own civilization? I'm glad you feel that way, Dad. Because I want to join the Lafayette Escadrille. What? I want to join the Lafayette Escadrille and go to France. Well, Walter, that's a fine sentiment. But I'm afraid it isn't very practical. You're hardly old enough for a thing like that. Of course I am, Dad. I'll take you at 18. But, Walter, what about your college? Oh, Dad, how can I keep my mind on studies with a war going on that's going to affect the whole future of the world? You won't have much voice in the future of the world, Walter, if you go over there and don't come back. I'll have to take a chance on that. A lot of other people have. Why did you have to talk to me first, Walter? Well, it... Because my father's German. Walter, I love my father. I'd do anything in the world rather than hurt him. Or let anybody else hurt him. I know he wants the Germans to win the war. What do you want, Hilda? I want you to go to France. If you want to go. I'd be proud of you, Walter. Come on, boy. Take care of yourself. You've been great, Dad. I know how you feel about it. That's all right, son. Goodbye, Mom. I'll write you every week. All right. Don't you worry. Hilda. hundred thousand casualties at Berton, a million dead and wounded on the Somme. And on the minds of men, the relentless pressure of war, dragging on into a third summer. At Jutland in the summer of 1916, the British Navy drove the German fleet to cover in the greatest sea battle of all time. And for the first time, Americans realized how great was their dependence on the might of the Royal Navy. The whole thing boils down to this, John. If we had a big army navy, we wouldn't have to worry about getting into war. I'm afraid there's some of my fellow congressmen who wouldn't agree with you, Jack. Well, they're wrong. And if Congress won't do something about preparedness, we'll have to do it ourselves. Say, Dan, I want you to put something in your paper for me. What about? You know that Plattsburgh training camp idea Teddy Roosevelt and General Wood have started? One here. What for? 
There's a war going on in Europe. You know as well as I do that if France and England are licked, we're next. You've been a soldier too long, Jack. Nobody's coming over here to fight us. Maybe not. But suppose we have to go over there to fight them. You know that's not going to happen. By 1916, Woodrow Wilson, now a king, could no longer ignore the growing demand for national defense. Republican candidate was Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes, advocate of a strong and forthright U.S. foreign policy. The only real issue in this campaign. The president has kept us out of war. He has sent notes to the warring nations of Europe. That's all he has done is send notes. Yes, the president has sent notes. But he has not sent one single American boy to his death on the battlefields. by a large plurality. 11.15 p.m. The Associated Press reports that with five states still unreported, Hughes is leading Wilson by a narrow margin. Here's to a real president of the United States. Charles Emily Hughes, drink her down, drink her down. Here's to Charlie Hughes, drink her down, drink her down. Here's to Charlie Hughes, he's in Woodrow Wilson's shoes. Drink her down, drink her down, drink her down, down, down. With the campaign slogan, he kept us out of war, Woodrow Wilson was re-elected. Europe had long since become a merciless process of attrition. To break the stalemate, Britain had introduced the tank. Germany was using liquid fire. The war went on into another winter, bringing death to some 5,000 men each day. touched the American community in many ways by the summer of 1916. The uh, Lafayette Escadrille is all Americans, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, what would happen to you if the United States should go into the war? Well, I understand we'll be commissioned into the U.S. Army Flying Corps. Hello, Hal. Well, hello, Mr. Meredith. It's good to see you. It's good to see him back again, all in one piece, isn't it? <laughs> certainly is. Yes, Boy, I, I guess the last thing you ever thought when you graduated was that you'd be an aviator in the French Army. Say, 
How old do you have to be to go to France? Hello, Anna. How's the party? All right. What's the trouble, Anna? My mother got a cablegram this morning. My father was killed. Anna. Do you think Walter Avery will be able to get back to America on his leave? Well, I don't know. He's a sub-lieutenant now, and they may not be able to spare him. Guard in the ranks. You men are at attention. And while I'm on the subject, you might as well get through your heads right now that you're not out here for a vacation. You're here to learn to do a job. A job of defending your country. Maybe it won't be very long before you have to do that job and do it right. Sergeant. Dismiss your company. Girls. Dismiss. Hello, Dad. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Mom. Why, Ralph, you must be tired to death. Oh, no, I'm fine. This is fun. Do they give you plenty to eat? Sure, all I can hold. Don't worry, Mom. Oh, Ralph, I can't help it. I hate to see you in that uniform. I hate it all. Oh, Mom. That's fine. In Europe, on a dozen separate battlefronts by the winter of 1916, four million men had met death in ways new and dreadful. And Germany had introduced the most terrible of all the First World War's new weapons, poison gas, chlorine and phosgene to choke the lungs and throat, mustard to burn the eyes and skin. To Americans, the use of poison gas seemed more horrible and barbarous than any other single action of the German high command. And Americans were fast reaching a decision. also received the Croix de Guerre for bravery and action. Can you imagine that guy, Hal Fisher, with his name all over the paper? Boy, I guess I was born just a little too late. Don't worry. We're going to get our chance yet. Did I tell you I'm getting into the Naval Reserve? Naval Reserve? You ought to be in the National Guard. I bet we go over the first week we're in the war. I'm going to sign up in the Marine Corps. 
Well, I want to do something and... We're going to be in this war. Fred, what will your father say? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. By now, pacifist songs were finding little favor. To be my pride and joy. Waiter. Who Waiter. What's to do with sir? How much is this? To shoot some mother, mother, Why can't you make up your mind whether you're Germans or Americans? Come on, let's get out of here. Trouble. It's time to put the sword and come away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say. Fires and explosions of mysterious origin had plagued the nation's industrial regions for two years. And Americans were now beginning to realize that these disasters were not all accidents. Thank you. How do you do, sir? How do you do, Professor Bensinger? Am I disturbing you? Not at all. Is there something I can do for you? If you could give me a few minutes. Certainly. I'm Karl von Schleich of the German Embassy. Yes. Professor Benzinger, it is imperative we stop the shipment of American munitions to France and England. As a German who is a respected member of this community, your influence can help the fatherland. Herr von Schleich. My home is now in America. I have a wife and two children who are Americans. If only for their sake, I cannot take sides. The war in Europe is a terrible thing. Naturally, I wish I could do something to help the fatherland. But, must be clear to you, I cannot. You know, I must report your answer to Germany, Professor Bensinger. Many Americans were beginning to suspect that the German ambassador, Count Johann von Bernstorff, was directing planned sabotage on a nationwide scale. An explosion of munitions on Black Tom Island, New Jersey, had rocked an area of 70 miles. Another explosion at Kingsland, New Jersey, destroyed in a few minutes millions of dollars worth of shells and ammunition. Time and time again came evidence that spies and saboteurs, well organized and financed, were attempting the systematic destruction of U.S. munition plants. The violence of war had touched the nation's shores, and America's traditional sense of security was shaken to the core. By 1917, Americans were facing the inevitable. I think most Americans feel about the way I do, John. You know I've never believed the propaganda. I've never been frightened by spies and I've hated war. But the time has come when we've got to fight for the decent, civilized things in life. I know, Ruth. It's just that I hate to think that I'll ever have to vote to put this country into war. 
More and more, the war in Europe was coming into the homes of the American community. I'm the office for a while, will you, Eddie? I've got to deliver a message across town. Can I deliver it for you? I think I'd better deliver this one myself. We'll run this one, George. seems to have brought the war in Europe very close. Perhaps this war is no concern of ours. Perhaps we should be in it. There are sincere thinking men and women on both sides, and we are under terrifying pressure on this question. From England and France and Germany come all kinds of reports. Most of them are half-truths. Some of them are lies. But Walter Averill didn't go to France for lies. He didn't go because of the lurid tales about the Hun and Bosch. I think Walter believed in his heart the same as I believe in mine, that there is a basic democratic principle and a primitive might makes right instinct. And today, these two are fighting to see which will survive. I think that's the fight for which young Walter Averill was willing to give up his life. Like an open challenge to the United States in the first weeks of 1917, came Germany's declaration that she was resuming unrestricted warfare against the vessels of all nations, belligerents and neutrals. Now the German government tells us that she will let us send just one ship a week across the Atlantic. We are told when it must leave when it must arrive, and where. We are told to paint stripes on it, that it must fly a flag of red and white checks like a farmer's tablecloth. I think I can truthfully say that no man in this house has advocated caution more consistently, has more consistently championed the cause of neutrality and peace. Now it seems that the efforts of all of us may be in vain. If they are to be in vain, then I say this. Let us thank God that we are on the side of justice and the right. <laughs> 